Uh, like I said, I'm uh, I I just turned 29. Uh, most everybody here did not wish me happy birthday. Uh, Carla, uh, I did. You did. Thank you. Family members did. I Kimberly did. didn't. You did. At work, bro. Elmer didn't. I'm David sorry, didn't. Mother. I'm holding grudges. Gosh. <laughs> Especially Steve. Oh, I'm Steve. Um, so, uh, I'm, I, you know, this year I decided to pick out my casket. I said, no, I want a gray. No, I'm kidding. I didn't. That'd be crazy, though. I already start thinking about that. But anyways, um, <coughs> I'm closer to the end. <coughs> and nobody knows, really. You know, I'm hoping it's 70 years out. I'm hoping. But nobody knows. It could be today. Who knows? You know, only God knows. But uh, I guess it's something we should start thinking about before we get there. We should, if eternity is indeed real, we should think about it now. And I think there's a good reason for us to do that. And I think the Bible offers us some good reasons of why we should start thinking about eternity now. And the question I think we should ask, is death really the end, or is it just the beginning? And if you notice, on this one, you'll be next. I think he's talking to you. Hopefully not Steve. We'll be next, all right? That's our future home for a while. Mm. All right, death isn't just the end or the beginning. Is the tombstone really the casket, or is it actually the doorway to the long one? All right? And uh, here's a quote on life. What is life? Life is the time God gives you to determine how you're going to spend your eternity. All right, either it's you'll only live once, enjoy it, or this is time God's given you to decide where you want to spend the part that really counts, which is the ever part. Um, so those are some things that we should be thinking about. <clears throat> and with that, life, life is measured in 60, 70 years, 80 if you're strong, the Bible says, 90 if you're Mexican and you like to work a lot, like me. I'm going on 100. I'm going for it. The little old man, he's 99, I just think. Turned 100. turned 100. Ooh, amazing. My grandma, Italian lady, she's 94, 8. Ooh. So it runs in the blood somewhere. I hope I got a little of it. That's your lifespan. But how can you measure eternity? Have you ever thought about that? I think Francis Chan one time, he was trying to show it what eternity is, and it's like a rope stretched out, and this little tiny piece is your life, you know, and probably smaller than that. It's just no measurement. This is your life, and eternity goes way that way and way this way, You're, where it's a little dot on the map, a little speck. It's like uh, the Bible talks about like a flower comes up, and then boom, it's dead. Um, that's life. So, it's a major topic of discussion, and we're going to start because we're going to we're going to talk about where you guys end up, where we end up after this. But today, I want to talk about eternity and why there is an eternity. Maybe you don't believe there is, but why there is. And I've got four points I want to go over. And the first one is. The reason why I believe there's an eternity is because we all die, okay? I'm just starting with bare minimums. We all die. None is immune. Everybody here in this room will be dead, guaranteed. If there's anything I'm right about, it's that. You're going to die unless Jesus comes back and you, you know, you're transformed. And everybody before us, 100 years ago, okay, let's say 110, because a little man's alive. 150. 200, everybody 2,000, all, this thing we have in common, they have in common, they're all dead. We're going to die. I know, you just come to grips with it, guys. I'm telling you, not yet, though. I just come to grips with it in a healthy way. 
in a healthy way is that we're all going to die. Everyone has to go. Oh, here's a quote. Everyone has got to die, but I've always believed an exception would be made in my case. An exception would be made in my case. I don't remember who wrote that, but I think that's how we feel, especially if we're young and good looking and vibrant and healthy. Not me. You know, or we think we're gonna we're the ones who are gonna make it to hundred. Sometimes not. I don't know. And the point is is that death is imminent. Alright? If death is imminent, that's the start. Let's talk about eternity. Uh, there's a guy uh, who I was listening to, um, Bill Nye, science guy. You mm -hmm. guys heard of him? Is that his name, Bill Nye? Yeah. Bill Nye. Yeah, well, he had a uh, he has a YouTube, and they people call him with questions. And this lady at called in and asked him, uh, "Do you think there's ghosts? Do you think there is an afterlife or something?" And he was sit saying. That's another reason right there, my old boy. Next week, with all love, we're gonna judge you. Uh, with all, with all, um, with all his knowledge, he gave some answer, and uh, he told her that there's no evidence that there's a hereafter. That pretty much that's what he was saying. He broke it down. It was like a five minute. Thing, but he said, there's no evidence of the hereafter. Uh, in my best opinion, this is it. So live the best you can. Enjoy every moment, because this is all you got. And really, uh, with, I was kind of arguing with this about Hannah yesterday, but in, ev in evolution, if, if it's the f survival of the fittest, really that is the case, is that the strongest survive, and if you're gone, that's it. I mean, you're part of the food chain. You've helped the next one come along. And that's it. You really, there is no real significance other than what you do here and now and, uh, and how, how you live. And that, that's it. There's no consequences hereafter. Maybe in other, in other religions there is, like uh, Buddhism, I believe. Hinduism. Hinduism. Thank you. I, I, I don't, yes, thank you. Uh, I don't remember all of it, but I know that you come back. The way you the way you perform here will determine how you come back and what. Some people come back as a little flea if they're really bad, um, or like an ant. So, everybody dies, but what comes next? Point number two is I believe we all have a soul. All right. This is another hot topic of debate. Most religions are pretty. Um, most religions are agreed upon this, that we have a soul. We have something in us that is um, uh, I forget the word, but there's some I'm going to read you the definition in a minute. Uh, but let's, let's read to Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. I have it up here if you guys uh, want to turn to it. This is the New Living Translation. It says, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Alright? So, we have a soul. Uh, and I think this is the first instance. And, and if you guys have questions, bring them out, because I have some questions about this. Alright? This is the first instance where it seems that the soul entered the man. Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust, and he breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. And if you could just imagine that, you know, dead guy laying there, and God just right in his nose. Whoa. I don't know. That would be crazy. And the man became a living person. What did God breathe into this guy that made him revive? Was it God breathed Every, like the soul, breathes spirit, breathe life. You know, of course it's life into him. But what is it all broken down into? What are all those components? Um, the word breath here, uh, neshama, you'd probably be able to do better than I could at that, is, uh, 
it's defined wind, uh, angry, vital breath, divine inspiration, intellect, an animal, blast, breath, inspiration, soul, spirit. So it could mean a wide variety of these things. Um, but it really is, is the whole person, his whole, everything was revived. His heart, his soul, his intellect, his, his entire being. And that's kind of what belie- what's, the soul is believed to be today, is the whole person. Well, let's see, I had a definition, let me see. Uh, <clears throat> uh, actually, in Hebrew... I was listening to the Bible Project. In Hebrew, they said the, the word soul actually means throat. And the reason why is because everything goes through there. And also, that's like the, like the breath of the person. But he, he was saying uh, in the Bible Project, you know, that the YouTube, they were doing a whole study on that word soul. Is that, that it really what it is is the entire person. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all of your strength. And with you, all your soul is your entire being. And uh, he was saying that's what soul is. Uh, but here's the definition I got from the 1828 dictionary, Webster's. The spiritual, rational, immortal substance in man which distinguishes him from brutes, that part of man which enables him to think and reason, which renders him a subject of moral government. The spiritual, rational, and immortal substance in man which distinguishes him from brutes. Anybody know what a brute is? I'm taking a wild guess and saying it's an animal. Nobody knows. Huh? You don't. You know what a brute is? I feel like it's just a bad word. Uh, but that would make sense because every person should, even even if you're a brute, you know, should have a soul. I think it's an animal. We'll have to look that up. Oh. Wow. Right. Yes. That's all right. <laughs> Uh, okay, so soul. How would you guys put that into your own words? Soul. Soul? It's, if you were going to define soul, what would you say? How would you define it? For me, soul, I think it's what a lot of people think is a conscience. That's what soul is. It's, uh, it's the thing that tells you, hey, this is real bad, or, yeah, it's just like conscious. Okay. Anybody else? Steve, what do you think? How would you define soul? Uh, something you're, you can't see, but that tells you right from wrong. Okay. Do you think, Elmer, do you think you have a soul? Maybe. Anybody else want to try to find soul in your own words? With, with all the movies you've seen, all the music we listen to, all the preaching we've heard, what is a soul? And do you have one? I don't know if you guys have heard that uh, speech that was given this week by, uh, I forget his name, Brett, Brett, the guy from Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, Chris Pratt. Chris Pratt, yeah. He went up in front of everybody, uh, all the movie stars. He was the... The... Generation. Yeah, he got the something of the generation uh, prize. A generational prize, something like that. And he went up and he, he said uh, he said nine things. I want to give you nine points. And he said, one of them, I don't remember which God one. God is real. God is real and you have a soul. He said, take care of it. And I think that's maybe something that's new to people because we think everything we're about is, is, is everything you can see, but there's actually something in you that makes you you more than what you look like. You're not going to touch on the one he said about looking at a party? Right. Yeah, I was, that was irrelevant. I wasn't going to touch on that. But it was pretty cool. You guys should watch it. He's bold. Yeah, he talked about grace. He talked about praying. I mean, right there in front of everybody. And the Riverdale clan was there, you know, and um, everybody. Oh, they were listening, clapping, and and then they had something else come up after, which was like ruined it. But it was it was cool. Um, soul. 
I'm going to read you another verse. Matthew 10, 28. All right? Soul, because God breathed it into us. You're not just a person. You're not just flesh and bone. Something inside of you. From Matthew 10, 28. Don't be afraid of those who cannot, who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy, destroy both soul and body in hell. All right, so the verse telling me, all right, homeboy can kill me with a gun, but he can't kill my soul. All right, I, I don't know how to comprehend that, but something in me, there's only one guy who can kill that, God himself. Only, only one thing can be destroyed about me, and that is my soul or my, the, whatever it is in me. Uh, the short definition of the soul is, is life or yourself, the vital breath, the breath of life, the human soul, the seat of affections and will is the human person, it's the total, in, it's the individual, it's who you are as a soul. And what I think about, what really gets me thinking is how does soul pass from Adam to his son, to them, all the way to us? Is God intricately involved as his soul to you? How does it work? That's what I was thinking about. Like a little baby in a womb. How can the mom give soul to the kid? I, uh, I, it's a mystery. I just, I don't know. Um, and uh, it, I, I just think it's amazing to think about. That we all have, there's something in us that's that's eternal something in us this this being um, and I don't I don't want to I, I I can't really describe it entirely to you guys because there's what I was reading is there's a little bit of um, distortion in the in the meaning from Greek mythology and Greek thinking and uh, original he, the Hebrew the way they saw it and there was a little blend that happened and we got the blend of it uh, in America today. So it's the what I what I was reading it on what I could agree on what seemed to be fair is that the entire person, and obviously something in you that only God can kill. There's part of you in everybody, and not only you here, but in every person that will pass beyond the grave. Um, so soul. You guys have any comments about that? So I know it's a little something I never really talked about. I'm no expert, to tell you that. I have one, but I don't know anything about it. It's there, some somehow. All right. Point number three: Why I believe we should believe in eternity. So we have, we're all going to die. We all have a soul, and eternity somehow, some way, is we we have these questions about it in us, naturally. And I want to read you a verse. Uh, actually, let, let me read you this quote from C.S. Lewis. It says, If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Alright? Let me read that again. If I find my des myself in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. All right, and we, we believe that. A lot of you, know, you here who've accepted Christ believe that for some reason there's not a thing in this world that can satisfy me. And many of us have tried it. Said, well, I've tried, I've tried guys. You know, some of you girls have tried guys. Some of you guys have tried girls drinking, smoking, uh, money, no money. And it just doesn't seem to work. Okay, then why do I still want more? Maybe because there's something in you designed that way to want something greater. And Ecclesiastes 3.11, written by Solomon, the big T, the, the wisest man to ever live, second wisest. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He's also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Alright? You believe that? He set eternity in the human heart. A little taste of it. 
some reason we want it. It's 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 almost like you know you're like a little baby. You don't want to give them the whole ice cream and say here, just have a lick. Mine, you know, take it back. No, no, I want it. You know, and then they're always asking ice cream, where is it? No, no, you can't have that. And you know, kind of like we do to babies. You know, we just get them, get them a little. Um, curiosity going and then they're never gonna want vegetables again ice cream you know that's and I'm the same way once I had cookies I'm through I always want them and in us we have this uh, what did I write let me see what I wrote God has placed uh, definition of, God has placed an awareness of the infinite within each of us. We're aware of it somehow. Somehow we know there's got to be more than this. Got to be. That will arise from death. We will rise from death after we die. Alright, it's kind of like the uh, Maze Runner. You know, where they're all in this little cage and one guy pops up and he's like, uh, we got to get out of here. Like, what? No, this is our life. You know? Some people are just fine there, but other guys are like, no, no, there's something more. He was having visions, like, I remember all this. It's kind of like that. You know, you have something in you wants more. And I was trying to look into myself this week, and I was sitting there, where is eternity? I didn't do that, I'm kidding. But, um, some people do, and I don't know if it's helpful or not. But, um, yeah, we just have this for civilizations ever since humanity's existed. All looking for God, looking for something greater. All right, so eternity is in our hearts. God's put it there purposely, purposefully. And my last point, and it's in First Corinthians 15. If you, if actually the whole chapter is awesome, but uh, I won't read it to you, the whole thing. Jesus proved there is life after death. All right, maybe you don't believe. Maybe you don't believe you're going to die, okay? Kimberly, you may be, I'm the exception. Maybe you think you're going to age gracefully and you're never going to get old and you'll never die. Or maybe you think you don't really have a soul. Once you hit the dirt, that's it. Your time was done. Okay? And whatever eternity, you, there is no eternity in your heart. You just have all these imaginations because when you grew up, your parents told you that. Maybe that's the case. But... Uh, this last one is hard to deny. That Jesus proved that there's life after death when He popped out of the grave, when He rose from the dead. And we're going to read a verse that Paul talks about. Uh, Paul wrote when he was addressing people who only had faith in this life. He said, I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe I'm going to rise after I die. I don't believe in the resurrection. I believe in Jesus. I believe He can help me. I believe He can heal. But I don't believe there's a resurrection. All right, and um, that was happening way back then. And in 1 Corinthians, I was going to read the whole thing, but I think it's kind of a lot of time. Is it? Anybody have anything? 1040. Um, <clears throat> let's just read verse 23. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Uh, anybody see that? Can you read it? 23. Good eyes. This is the way it is. Christ was raised from the dead first. Then all those who belong to Christ will be raised from the dead when He comes again. Alright. So this is, this is how the Paul said. This is how it is. Okay? Whether you disagree or not. Christ rose from the dead. That means you will. He rose first. Then all who belong to Him will be, will be raised from the dead when He comes again. Okay, and in, in this particular verse, it sounds like it's only the people who belong to Christ. But if you, if you read all the verses that talk about this, everybody's going to rise. But the ones who belong with Christ are going to be rose and with Him. You know, they're going to go with Him. Um, <clears throat> so Jesus, His resurrection gives us hope that we're going to rise. Okay. If, there, if you're still having doubts about eternity in your heart, about the soul and all this, the fact alone that He rose from the dead, which is what all of our faith is based on, everything, if that didn't happen, we're all idiots. Even Carla. All of us. Stupid. If He didn't rise from the dead, 
we have nothing. We, we, are, we are singing to the walls. Pointless. I'm preaching for no point. If he didn't rise, because it, it, we're not rising. This is it. This really is it. So we're going to have to enjoy it. You know, let's just uh, let's sell the church. Let's uh, purchase a yacht. We can share it all during the year with all the congregants. Um, we can save our 10% and we can invest it in a new truck or something. I can invest it in my business. You know, we can, uh, we can just, you know, we can transform God's laws and nah, whatever. You know, we can do whatever. We can start a weed farm. Smoke it all the time. If he didn't rise from the dead, there is no point. But Paul is telling him, no, but he did. But he did. And you're going to rise too. And in verse 42 it says, It's the same with people who are raised from the dead. The body will turn back to the dust. Just like when Adam was created from the dust, said, you're going to go back to the dust. When it's put in the grave, when the body is raised from the grave, it will never die. And then when you come up again, which is the second life, you'll never die again. And we're going to get into that later about <clears throat> some conflicts with that, but not now. The point is that you live twice. <clears throat> All right? Uh, <clears throat> Jesus proved it, and God gave us the assurance. He says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Whoever puts his trust in God's Son will not be lost, but will have life that lasts forever. Okay? That's a promise from God. You trust in my Son, I will give you eternal life. Hard to you know, imagine that. Because when, as soon as we walk out these doors, we grab our phone again, who liked me? You know, who, that's our focus. Whether we're gonna, what we're going to be doing in eternity is a, eh. Because there's more, there's more immediate concerns uh, that come up. <clears throat> so, I guess we just have to think about tombstones, like we wrote, you're next on one of those tombstones, are they really the end? Or is it just, are they like a little doorway to the next, to the one that really matters? To one that really, really matters. And we'll have to challenge that YOLO concept. Is it you only live once? Or is it you only live twice? I don't know. How are we going to challenge that? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody has been there. That's the thing. We're talking about a concept that not one of us and nobody we know has ever gone to the other side. Not a, nobody alive now except Jesus. Only one. And he'll be the only one until everybody comes up. And he's the only one who's ever done it. Except, well, Lazarus too, but I don't know. Um, <clears throat> uh, think about this. You know that people, you know the way the way we live. I know that we all have a lot of stuff. Like I have a lot of things on my mind that keep me quite occupied during the week. Bills, bills, and bills. Singleness, aging, losing my hair, white hairs, need food, getting chubby. You know all these things that I'm so concerned with right now. The last thing I want to think about is life after, because I'm having a hard enough time keeping up with the one I have now, you know, and it's so hard to think about it, but what I, what I was, I was reading about somebody wrote is that they said, actually, you know, people think, if you're, you've heard this maybe before, if you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. If you're always thinking about heaven and my life there, you're useless here on earth. But on the contrary, the people who were so heavenly minded did the most, were the most, what's the word, effective here on earth. And think about these people. I'm going to throw a couple names out. Think about the 12 disciples. Were they most concerned about developing their fishing business or did they give it all up for the gospel and for bringing God's kingdom? And how effective were their lives? Twelve disciples changed the whole course of history, you know, by 
going out and preaching the Gospels. Heaven, they were thinking about eternity. They were actually living for eternity. Right here. Uh, Billy Graham. Think about another guy. He, thinking about eternity. This life is not it. And I need to tell somebody. And look at all the... It is amazing to hear about all the millions of people who have heard of it. Thousands who are Christians because of it. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, some other names. Uh, uh, Curry. I don't know if we can... Stephen Curry. He's a Christian. I don't know if you put them in that category, but I thought it was pretty awesome. You <laughs> said... Uh, I, I can't spell it. I couldn't spell it, sorry. I was thinking of, I was like, is this the curry that you eat, or is this curry basketball player? I don't know how to spell it, my bad. Um, <clears throat> you know, thinking, playing basketball, but at the same time he's Christian, and he's wanting to make an eternal impact. Tim Tebow, he's thinking about eternity. You can see by the what things he does. Charles Spurgeon, great preacher and evangelist, uh, way back, um, huge contributions to the faith. C.S. Lewis, you know, he, he wrote the Narnia Chronicles, wrote a lot of stuff. Uh, people who actually lived knowing that there's an eternity had the most impact here. And the people who thought this was it had a great impact, but not anything for the, for the good. You know, maybe like Hitler or maybe... Uh, Somebody who made a great business. They, had, you know, they did great for themselves, but not for other people. Not for helping, but a great impact. Are tombstones really the end, or are they actually just the doorway? And I, I guess the challenge for us, the challenge um, would be, how should we then live? What, what changes, if eternity does exist, how would it change the way I live right now? How, what, what changes would I have to make to get ready for it? Is, is a few extra pounds really that big a deal? As, because if my life is really just a centimeter compared to miles, I need to make sure I'm ready for what's happening next. I mean, it's so critical. Uh, but I think the lie of the devil today is that, no, actually you live once, and that's it. So continue, do whatever you want. Um, I want to read this verse to you because this is actually what we're basing our worship night off of. I'm gonna read, uh, I just want to read this to you. It says, but make sure that you don't get so absorbed and exhausted and taking care of all your day by day obligations that you lose track of the time and doze off oblivious to God. The night is about over, dawn is about to break, be up and, and awake to what God is doing. God is putting the finishing touches on the salvation work He began when we first believed. We can't afford to waste a minute. We must not squander these precious daylight hours in frivolity and indulgence and sleeping around in dissipation and bickering and grabbing everything in sight. Get out of bed, get dressed, don't loiter and linger, waiting until the very last minute. Dress yourselves in Christ and be up and about. The Message Bible. <clears throat> I love it. Pretty much what he's saying is, there is an eternity. God saved your life. Stop living to do whatever your flesh wants to. Stop sinning. Stop living in that. Get ready because eternity's coming and you're closer than ever. And I took it, man, I'm closer than I was last year, that's for sure. Um, but he says, you know, just stop doing all this thing. Get dressed. Get ready and get out and live. Start living for Christ. You know, that should be the, the urge. Okay, if eternity's coming... Where am I going to go? Because there's only two options, at least, that we know of, that the Bible's clear about. Is you're either going to heaven, or you're going to hell. There's only two options. You're going to die. And whether there's an afterlife, there's only two options. <laughs> and that's what we're going to be talking about over the next weeks, is... For one, 
what are what what is you know what is hell? Who goes there? And any other questions you guys might have. But uh, the challenge would be for us. I think the most important thing is that if eternity really exists, then how should we live? How would that change the way we live now? Should we think about it every so often, like, oh man, what? You know, can I do anything that will change my eternity? And and you know what? There actually is a whole lot, and it's actually more simple than you thought. Uh, John three sixteen says, "Whoever believes in my Son will have eternal life." You trust in my Son. That that word trust, believe, is huge. It's not just go jump in the water and get wet. You know, trust is is all of your confidence in Him. Place your whole life in Him. Give it to Him. And eternity is yours. And I was thinking about that today. Is I have eternal life right now. You know, I got it. I have the I have the assurance that I'm going to get there. That I'm going to be there. So that'll be our next topic for next week. Where will you be in eternity? Be heaven or hell. And we're actually going to start with hell. Because <clears throat> there's a lot of questions. Is it actually forever? Or is it annihilation where when you go and you burn and you're done? That's it. Or does God burn you forever? Does He allow you to be burned? Or do you allow yourself to be burned forever?